Yes, and when Angelica and I met, we were actually not involved with ice and the Arctic, but with the deep sea and had the pleasure of joining as very young uh, people to an expedition from Costa Rica to Hawaii. That's when we really started out our love to the deep sea and of course to the great Pacific, but today it will be about the Arctic. Thank you very much for inviting me and for kicking off a distinguished lecture series. I like this idea of coming together, speaking and discussing. We have almost forgot over the last two years and almost three years to do this. And it is fantastic to see real people and not a Zoom conference. So where I want to take you is um, the area of the Earth where we often forget that it's actually quite a large proportion of planet Earth that we call cryosphere that is ice covered. When you look at the globe, and you might all think for a moment, that's an unusual view I take here, is because all of our globes, they are sitting on a spine that you can circulate the continents and look at the oceans, but you can't turn it to an Arctic and the Arctic. There should be polar globes that can do that. But when you look out for a moment, you can see um, on the one side, the Arctic Ocean with um, the ice cover, you recognize probably Greenland, which is our northern hemisphere continent with a lot of ice on top. And uh, it's two to three kilometers of ice. And then on the right side, you see Antarctica, an entire continent with an equally thick ice cover. And it's so amazing to think about how much water is frozen in our times. But for the history of Earth, it was not always like that. So for the Northern Hemisphere, we understand today that it is about three million years, potentially, that we've had such an ice-covered area. Ice means it is white, it reflects the sunlight, it has a, a permanent predictable temperature, and that influences our weather patterns, the climate to which all organisms then adapt. It has far-reaching effects if there is ice in the Arctic or not, and beyond 3 million euros, there was a big change on Earth due to various important reasons, the angle of Earth to the sun. But since 3 million years about, we can say there was an ice-covered Arctic, sometimes with immensely thick ice. We are just studying for the Arctic Ocean this transition around 150,000 years ago when there was potentially really hundreds of meters of ice on top of the Arctic Ocean. The dynamic of Earth is immense, and then to think that the organisms living in the Arctic Ocean, the youngest ocean of Earth, had maybe a few million years of living in a predictable environment, and now we are facing a non-predictable environment. Much of my talk will be about that. But first, to bring you into the mood of exploring the cryosphere, the ice, and what lives beneath us, I would like to show you one ancient map of 1595, I just, I'm just back from Florence where I looked at various perspectives that people had in the Renaissance and afterwards on the discovery of Earth. And what you see here is that people had imagined in the 16th century and beyond that the Arctic Ocean would actually be a hidden continent, an island that would be to be discovered full of riches and many expeditions were started to go there and unravel these islands and the continents that no one knew at that time. And expeditions to the ice, they were not very fortunate for a very long time. People that had to go on wooden boats into the ice had to learn how to cope with ice. You might remember or you might have seen this image by Caspar David Friedrich. Um, and uh, it is in Hamburg, you can still look at it. And uh, it is called Into the Ice. But when you look up, you see this little wooden boat that has uh, capsized, tilted over by the pressure of the ice. And so all of the, the memories we have from that time of European explorers into the ice were mostly expeditions with a sad ending. We have to understand, though, that for 10,000s of years, there were also people, humans on Earth, that were making a full living that actually flourished in the Arctic. So there was always human culture knowing how to work, how to walk, how to interact with animals in the ice. And so we have this double view of a part of, of the people struggling with ice and another part surviving with the help of ice. And we have to bring these two views together, as you will see later. 
the first successful expedition that really managed to deal with the ice in a proper way was that of Fridtjof Nansen. And look when it happened, 1893 to 1896, Fridtjof Nansen, he was able to bring a wooden ship to the ice he understood, other than the other explorers, that ice, sea ice, would be drifting and he also speculated there would be no continent. It would be an ocean with ice on top and he would just have to find the right entry point and then the sea ice would drift with his wooden vessel, the Fram, across the North Pole and back into the area of Spitzberg. He almost managed, he didn't really manage to go to the North Pole, but when you see his trajectory here, so moving up with the ship along the coast, getting frozen in and then drifting, then too soon he drifted across this area that is uh, more or less shelf area. And uh, he wished very much, he tried on skier to reach the North Pole, but it didn't really work out. In the end, the expedition came back with lots of knowledge and lots of data and everyone alive. From Friedrich Nansen, we have these famous books that totally intrigued me as a kid already when I thought about becoming deep sea explorer, but also polar explorer. And what few people only know is that Friedrich Nansen had an important hobby and he took microscopes along and actually studied life in the sea ice. He has left some 10 books or more behind where he wrote about you just take a, a piece of ice and a drop of water and then you sit there and study and you will find amazing amounts of animal and plant life in the ice thereby understanding that nature has this amazing ability to generate life everywhere and even in the permanent ice there would be fertile grounds. So this idea of a whole sphere of Earth that seems out of reach to humans in a way, but full of life that is undiscovered, that was of course intriguing all of the work after and is still today. On a little side note, here you see the drawings and some of you, I don't know if here at Senckenberg you also have people that like unicellular life, uh, but you might recognize a couple of the organisms he was drawing. When you read his 10 books, you understand how different scientific writing has become just show you a tiny little bit of his diary of observations. And so basically he just wrote in real time what he was seeing under the microscope, explaining he had no species names, he had no help. He was just sitting there and giving each of these little organisms a place in the history of discovery by explaining how they were paddling, how they were eating each other, how they were reproducing. And this goes on for 10 books, but in his times, people found that very exciting and wanted to read more. That's the intro into expeditions and sea ice as a fascinating habitat. When I was a PhD student, and I, for the first time, after having already roamed the Atlantic and the Pacific, going with the ship to the ice, I found it very uncomfortable because for a ship to enter the ice, you actually had to ram it. You, you really take speed and an icebreaker like Polar Stern, with its entire weight, it, it really pushes itself onto the ice floor and then with its weight, it breaks through. And for a moment, when you're standing in the laboratory as I was, it felt really uncomfortable because the ship usually tilts in one way or the other way. You try to pipette, everything goes wrong, things fall over. And then eventually in the last moment when you're already at 30 degrees and you think now you will be falling, the ship breaks through and then you continue to crawl on. I, when I swore to myself never again to polar seas because it's so loud and terrible, but then slowly you get adapted and you start to like it. And for me, it was especially fascinating that with the ship you can exit and you can walk on the ice and beneath you, four kilometers deep or 4.5, you have the deep sea. You are walking on the ice and you have potentially your camera hanging down. So some people are walking up there and then you look at the same time down there. So I found it fascinating. And most people that are exposed to polar seas fall in love with the white landscape and discover after some time it's not that white. It has a lot of colors. Light makes an immense uh, reflection and all of it is very fascinating. So after I completed my PhD, I was really looking forward to having more adventures, but it took a while till I came back and was able to complete a first series of comparisons of the Arctic Ocean and the first description of what lives in terms of microbiology in the deep Arctic and today. A few facts that we need for comparing what lives uh, in the ice and what lives uh, beneath. The first thing we all need to understand is what this frozen water actually does. It's a white landscape, as we said before, and you all know, of course, when the sun shines onto the ice, 
a lot of the sunlight is reflected and this albedo is part of the stable climate that we have. It means a lot to the organisms living beneath because where you have thick sea ice, almost no sunlight penetrates and you have reduced primary productivity. When the ice gets thinner, as it did after the 1980s, you get more sunlight penetrating through the ice, more primary productivity. So we imagined with the onset of sea ice retreat due to global warming that the Arctic would actually blossom more, produce more algae, have maybe more fish. So that was the early hypothesis that more warmer seas, less sea ice would mean a more flourishing, productive ocean. It is important to think about the importance of sunlight for polar seas, because what we often forget is the little time in the season that organisms have to actually use sunlight for primary productivity, for seeing something, for feeding. And so think for a moment uh, the situation with sunlight. In around the North Pole, the first sunlight that is enough photons to actually have algae produce biomass is around May to June. Then there are two months in which the algae can actually grow. And after a little delay by a few weeks, all of the critters come to the surface, to the ice, and eat everything that is just produced. The crustaceans, the fish, everything is there. In the end, also the whales. It is amazing to be in the sea ice and at the sea ice margin in around uh, June. Um, you will think that you're in a zoo for all of the life that comes and is so occupied with feeding and stuffing itself because for the rest of the year, at around August to September, the sunlight is again too weak to sustain primary production. And then basically the productive cycle ends. And so at that time, the organisms that want to make it to the winter already must have stored a lot of lipids, fat. They must have already stored the reserves to then reproduce again, form X, and it's amazing when you pick out a couple of these crustaceans, they are bright red often from this orange lipid they produce. So now when you remember this, just these two months where everything happens and the rest of the time it is dark and actually pitch black dark during winter time, you understand what a special um, environment that is. Now remember that for biology, it is a bit worrisome to know of an ecosystem where everything is triggered to meet and reproduce in just one month. If the sea ice melts earlier, then for example, the ice algae will grow earlier, but the crustaceans who have a molecular club will have not adapted to the earlier food. They will wake up and start feeding or their eggs, their larvae will hatch at the time when the algae have already potentially been eaten by jellyfish. And so this idea of this absolutely triggered ecosystem where the shift in how thick the ice is, how warm it is, when the sunlight becomes available, changes everything for the ecosystem, is a dangerous situation. That's why we call the cryospheric environments very vulnerable environments. The second argument why we call them vulnerable is because they're so extreme with the temperatures and everything that lives there that about half of them are endemic. And so when you change an ecosystem where half of the organisms is endemic, the chances that you lose some species forever is very large. And also when you shrink an environment like you do with the Arctic that warms where the sea ice retreats, then the organisms that are belonging to the sea ice that are adapted, they lose habitat in space and time. And today we know no other habitat on Earth shrinks so fast as the Arctic sea ice. When I was a student, though, much of the knowledge was about just knowing what lives in the sea ice. So my peers and I, we tried to understand sea ice bacteria, special kinds of bacteria. Interestingly, they occur from the sea ice in the seawater down to the deep sea because it's equally cold everywhere, minus one degrees. So you have types of bacteria that do not organize by depth, but basically because the unique and uniform temperature and the exchange of waters that could be the same bacteria everywhere. You have also specific, uh, very large sea ice bacteria. They tend to be large in the brines. So the sea ice has little brines, pores with salt water that doesn't freeze up in which the bacteria live. And they are essential, of course, for the little critters, myofauna that also lives in the sea ice, nematodes and so on that live there in, and eat the bacteria. You have in the sea ice, specific diatoms, algae, 
that occur only in the sea ice, not in seawater, which is a mystery till today, because every winter sea ice freezes back again, but then soon after it has its unique own community that is not the same as in the seawater. So where are they coming from? How is the cycle started again and again? These were big questions at the time when I was studying. Some of these algae are fantastic because they form really large colonies. You will meet some later on. When I was out there in the sea ice, I noticed that something unusual happens uh, in the summer. Very often the sea ice algae tend to clump up to occur in these large batches that you see here, greenish, brownish, sometimes the entire ice, when the, when the boat would go through and the ice would flip, it was brown from the underside. So we in Germany, we cannot at this time really afford so well to have divers diving under the ice. Human diving under the ice is the most dangerous thing you can come up with. And uh, often we work with Norwegian divers, Russian divers to have that. And uh, here I show you a little bit of the results from Hakon Hopp, a famous Norwegian diver on the right side, photographies from um, the famous Russian diver Melkinov. And when you look now to the underside of the ice, it is a fully grown, blown ecosystem in itself, almost like a reversed seafloor. What you see here that looks like, like almost kelp is unicellular diatoms that grow in colonial forms and can really form these very long threads in which a lot of crustaceans and fish larvae and organisms hide. They are not often fed upon, these large algae, but they are really an environment for so much life. And one could sit there for hours looking at all of this active life under the sea ice. It's also a realm of jellyfish that's quite amazing. From a ship, you cannot sample these. If you go through with the icebreaker, everything is mixed up and turned over. But if you sit there quietly and watch with the robot that you, or a camera that you lower from the ice, you'll discover that the under ice is really full of amazing life. This notion of a complex and huge ecosystem in the ice is traditionally known by the Inuit that have made a living for thousands of years. We have to correct the time that the Paleo Inuit actually were able to walk across the ice bridges, uh, crossing from Beringia, is what we call the Bering Strait, crossing over to Greenland, crossing over to the Americas. So there were people living with the ice and all the organisms that live above and in and under the ice that understood very well that there is a network of life interacting. The Inuit were able to cooperate with the seals and the whales and, and survive very well. Um, and uh, this is a picture from a textbook of, of Inuit where you see this understanding that all of it is connected, including the humans. So again, when I started out, I thought about this idea of being able to better understand this network and especially give a place, a voice, names to the deep sea life, the so-called benthos at the seafloor. But I would like you, because in the end when we discuss, we will come back to that, I would like you to remember that contrary to our common perception that there is this empty Arctic Ocean, uh, a remote place that is frozen where no one can live today, the Arctic Ocean that is surrounded by countries like Russia, Alaska, Canada, and Greenland, and Svalbard, is the place on Earth where we have still the most diversity of human cultures. There are over 40 tribes and settlements with specific cultural language, oral and uh, practical traditions, and we should not forget that the Arctic is home to people that have lived there much longer than we, the European invaders, ever did. In 2011, Paul Wassmann, a uh, dear friend and colleague of mine, he published a paper about exactly that, the pan-Arctic view of this strange Arctic Ocean. Here the sea ice is removed. And you look at the ocean and its ridges, you recognize Greenland again for orientation and Norway. And he discussed in his review paper, for the knowledge of all the changes that are happening, how come we miss long-term ecological observation in the entireness of the central Arctic Ocean. The little dots that you see on the map are long-term ecological observation time series. It means where scientists go year after year and do the same measurements again and again and again. And you can recognize that the observatories that we have are bound to the shelf seas, some are at the ice margin of, of uh, Canada, for example, and Alaska. 
um, and some are of Greenland. There are our little dots that we have in the Fram Strait, where we cooperate with Norway, also on the, the deep sea. But in the middle of the Arctic Ocean, nothing, not one long-term time series. And that really bugged me. So I thought when I, at that time, I was no longer a PhD student, but a professor, when I can do anything about polar research, I want to achieve long-term ecological observations there where there is none. Because at that time, we already knew that the biggest change was ongoing. Now, understanding change in science is a complicated thing. Look again how long it took before the observations of sea ice cover were safe enough to predict that sea ice was shrinking on Earth. In 1967, we had a full understanding as humans that there was too much CO2 in the atmosphere. But when you look at the satellite recording of sea ice, you can check for yourself when would you dare to paint or to predict a trend in shrinking sea ice. You actually have to go for the natural dynamics that we have. You would go actually to beyond 2000 to say, oh, now I think something is really happening and sea ice is retreating. And exactly that is what was happening. So Paul, when he wrote, he wrote a paper when it was clear because about 10 years we only saw, with a little wiggle waggle, we only see shrinking sea ice. Today we are here and we have a clear trend and the trend tells us Sea ice is lost in the Arctic in its extent with 13% per decade. And then you can just continue with that trend line and you will know at what point in time the sea ice will be depleted if it's a linear trend. And we have exceptions like this year, for example. I was in a way sad but also lucky because in 2012 I had the largest international expedition at that time of the late summer and autumn with polar stern being the only ship out there in the Arctic observing what it means if more than usual uh, shrinking of sea ice happens. So it changed the way I thought about research and also the voices that we have as scientists. Because here I was fully an explorer, here I was still an explorer because little was known about the ice cover deep sea, but I saw how the environment changed from my PhD to my professorial life. It was just not the same sea ice anymore. Everything felt different. So with all the people on board, we made a plan of how we would be able, in international collaboration, to describe what lives above and in the, the deep basins of the Arctic Ocean. There are four basins, the Canada Basin, the Makarov Basin, the Amundsen Basin, very deep, and the Nansen Basin. This is the most European basin with the most data because Norway did a lot of work, but also Russia and others, they studied the Nansen and Amundsen Basin for quite a bit. Fram Strait is where the Atlantic water flows in. And here you see temperature in the sea. So first you see it's very cold. The deep sea is minus 1 to minus 1.5. That's very, very cold for life to, to flourish at those temperatures. And the Atlantic brings in relatively warm water. So. What I wanted to do for understanding life in the basins is to really connect from what I know that lives in the ice to the deep sea. How are the two connected, the sea ice and the deep sea? The first connection point we've already discussed, algae that live in the sea ice or between the sea ice, they are potentially the food for the deep sea life, sinking down at the end of the summer, dying and sinking down either as algae or as the fecal pellets of crustaceans, the exudates from crustacean life, or maybe the crustacean carapaces. So what sinks to the deep sea is that what the deep sea has as food intake. So I created this expedition, not knowing that 2012 would be the largest sea ice minimum of all time so far. And I wanted to help creating this big baseline of productivity and life under the ice, in the ice, and at the seafloor most amazing instrument that exists uh, since uh, the, the 70s is the so-called sediment trap. It's just a giant funnel of about a square meter entry and it collects particles that fall just into that funnel and then below you have a rotating circle with little bottles and the bottles capture per week or per month, whatever you program, everything that falls down. And here you see the beauty of seasonality in the Arctic. So I'm sure that all of you know now exactly, even though you are not uh, polar researchers, where is the summer and where is the winter? Easy to guess, huh? But look how there is just two weeks where everything that is there for a year, 80% of what can be fed upon in the deep sea, falls in two weeks into the deep sea, a little bit before and after, 
but nothing, really nothing in winter time, in the old days. So we checked also the, the question of the benthos and its activity and response to that summerly sedimentation. For that we use quite advanced landers, they don't look very pretty in design, but it's basically steel frames with chambers and sensors which we can lower to the deep sea, they stand there for three days, they measure oxygen respiration by the simple formula of reverse photosynthesis, so CO2 plus water, heat or sunlight makes carbon, and the reverse is, as we eat, the heterotrophic, we digest glucose with the respiration of oxygen, and we just need to measure respiration of oxygen, the decline in oxygen when we enclose a piece of seafloor, then we know how much carbon is eaten by the benthos. We did that for everywhere in the Arctic um, and looked at the depth gradient and found out beyond about 1,000 meters, or you can say beyond the deeper continental margin, 2,000 meters, there's about a similar amount of respiration rate. It's higher out there in the Nordic Atlantic than in the Central Arctic Ocean. We measured the lowest values we know from Earth today in the deep sea of the Arctic Ocean, thereby confirming again that the life in the Arctic is entirely carbon starved. We have tiny amounts of respiration um, that we can measure uh, for the Arctic life. It's about one to two millimole, and that means like not a fraction of a slice of a toast. Of course, you want to relate that to the organisms that live in the Arctic. So I'm very proud that with a lot of work, none of this resulted in nature or science papers, but we managed at least in a collaboration between Russia, Germany, Norway, and the US, and a bit also Canada, to produce a map of all life we have recorded, benthic life we have recorded in the Arctic Ocean. You can see there is a huge gap off of Canada. Canada has not an icebreaker for science that can go out. And uh, we also had a problem with Norway that for a long time could study only its own seas. And much of the data were eventually produced by Polar Stern, some by Odin, a Swedish icebreaker. So we also had limited ship availability. When you look at that map and you just look at the numbers of biomass of life, you recognize how little there is in the deep Arctic Ocean, as predicted. So there's a big decrease in the biomass and abundance of life from the productive shelf seas, the former ice margins, out there to the deep ocean. Some of this life uh, you can recognize here. I love the transparent, shiny Colga hyalina sea cucumber. There are ophiurids. There's Alpedia, there are sea anemones, there's little critters, many of them are hidden actually in the sediments that look like brownish, light brownish, and that's what most of the Arctic Basin deep sea looks like. It's minerals, clay minerals that are transported in from the big shelf areas. The Arctic has the biggest shelf areas of all oceans, and currently there's a flow of minerals down into the Arctic Basin. And let's have a look when we have a camera on a multicora, that's a sampling device for sediments, um, how the seafloor looks like. Here you see it looks a bit like a desert. Many of you, especially Angelica, who is probably is the woman on earth who spent most of the time looking at such images, looks like a desert. When you go very close, then we've seen something surprising in 2012. In the deep sea, at three to four kilometers depth, here and there, we saw giant swarms of sea cucumbers that were apparently waiting for the summer food to arrive, for them to grow bigger. The multicora is the instrument with which we take undisturbed samples, and then we can measure everything, and to have the combination of samples, sediment samples, to then use for animal sorting and the animals on picture, allows us to understand quite a bit about the distribution of that benthic life. Now, what did we find out from the Arctic 2012 summer mission? Everything changed in that summer. This is the area where we sampled. In yellow, the former sea ice margin. In white, what was left of sea ice in August, it retreated further towards September. And the red dots are actually the stations we've looked at. We had a, a bunch full of young scientists on board, and for them it was quite amazing because they had dreamed of that mission for a very long time. Usually it takes five years to prepare such a mission. 
Many of them wanted to do a PhD. They had a plan of what they wanted to do. But then we were out there and daily called by the media saying that, oh, we see from the satellites the sea ice is melting away. What do you see? How does it feel? And we were just out there trying to do our job. And then we had to reshuffle our experiments, our measurements, because it was so amazing to just see all of the sea ice going away. For many of the scientists, it was really a revolution in understanding how fast their environment could change. So the first thing is, of course, the sea ice itself. The satellite pictures always show this white area of sea ice, but when you're out there with a helicopter flying here over the North Pole, and you see how little there is left, then you understand that the way we depict data also matters for communication. Polar Stern went to the ice as it was just butter or so. There was no ice breaking anymore. Um, it was just not the same as when I've studied it uh, 15 years earlier. The ice itself was so thin. It was from three to four meters. In my PhD time, it has now thinned down every summer to less than a meter. And so with an ice drill, it takes you just one hand and 80 centimeters, and then the very warm Atlantified Ocean pops up. And of course, it melts the ice from the underside. So what happened when we looked in 2012 to the seafloor was actually, and that's so very logical, that the normal Arctic brownish seafloor was sprinkled with sea ice algae. Everything that lived in the sea ice melted out and sank down to the seafloor. We were able, again, with the multicora to see that, record it, count it, and even sample these blobs, these whitish-greenish blobs. They were living diatoms. We could bring them back up to the top, to the ship, and regrow them again to normal sea ice colonies. They were still alive. They just fell down to the deep sea. And there was the sea ice life, the bacteria, everything that doesn't belong to the Arctic deep sea was still alive and in it. So we saw this complete change in export flux. We asked ourselves, now, what does happen in the deep sea? Is that normal that they see this falling of melozera? Which organisms are eating? the algae, these, these giant blobs. Here you see again our sample, a huge blob of the under ice sea ice algae. And here the diatoms, you, this is how they sit in the sea ice. This is how we saw them down uh, from, the, from the algae that we collected from four kilometers dip. And this is actually the sea cucumber um, gut with living algae inside. The two only species we could observe being able to eat that quantities of carbon that Arctic animals have never seen before in their lives were actually the cow-like sea cucumber colga, one other tiny sea cucumber, and an ophiurid, a starfish. So these other organisms that we know are living in the Arctic, the polychaetes, the crustaceans, they did not come, not the amphipods, nothing responded to that blob. So we thought it's maybe very new and uh, they might need to accustom and we wanted to know further, how can we now tell the story of this new change that we've observed in one year directly from the sea ice retreat to the deep sea? And we thought we should just be able to put our landers right onto these sediment blobs and see if even the bacteria responded to the freshness of these algal exports. And so we did. It was technically very, very challenging. We really had to place the multicora, the landers, and everything on these blobs that you see littered across the seafloor. But finally, we managed, and we were able to show the Arctic seafloor still had a lot of oxygen. So this is oxygen in the pore water of the sediment. You see the very tiny respiration rate that you normally get. And wherever we poked into the algae, you saw that the bacteria had already started degrading the, the matter, thereby consuming all the oxygen. So we were there when, for the first time in maybe three million years, parts of the Arctic seafloor became anoxic. And we could show that eventually the referees didn't accept the hypothesis first. They said, ah, you were not there before. Maybe it was it's all very different. Maybe that's very usual. But we showed them that just under the, the algae, we had this reduction in oxygen. But deeper down, there was still a lot of oxygen in many areas telling more an evidence of it's brand new what we see. We are, we are just there when everything started changing. Why does the strange algae behave that way? That's what the referees also asked us. So again, remember, it's unicellular diatoms. They clump up with a lot of slime. They need that slime to change the sea ice as it freezes. And they freeze it into the pores to have a hold fast because they don't have roots or anything. So then you have these slimy diatoms producing a lot of oxygen bubbles. 
that makes them float. And when they're happy, when they have nutrients and sunlight, then they float. When it gets dark or when they lack nutrients, they will not produce oxygen bubbles and then they sink to the deep sea. And that was happening. It got too warm for them and uh, the ice was melting away, so they would not produce any more oxygen and they would be sinking straight to the seafloor. We could show all of that and finally, when we returned from that mission, we published in Science the first description of this gigantic change of an entire ocean in one summer season. Well, there are many questions arising. Many questions are arising from that. And um, I will now briefly run to the questions we have to answer in the future because in summer I will go back and it is another 11 years past since that 2012 time and I want to do it all again to test the hypothesis that we have that we were at the onset of a beginning of a trend of exporting sea ice carbon to the deep sea which formerly didn't happen because it would just stay over the winter time. There are two young, almost PhD students that will accompany me that are sitting here in the audience. And so this is for them to point out what interesting questions we can ask for the future. Of course, in a way, we still have to answer the question, how does this all fit together? So how can there be at all life in the deep sea when there's so little food? So what we are working on is to understand globally in all deep seas, what is actually there in terms of food and energy is the oldest question of deep sea research, right? So already in the 16th century, people were wondering about the potential of life in the deep sea and they wanted to know what are these animals feeding upon if there is no photosynthesis. It falls down, okay? But what if there is only a slice of toast at the surface and we all know that 90% of it is always recycled up in the surface. So only 10% is falling down, it makes one millimole and that is already eaten by only the crustaceans, the copepods and everything. They need already one to two millimole of carbon. The deep sea life needs one to two millimole. So we just cannot satisfy the life that is existing by what we think is produced at the surface. These energy problems we often find with deep sea from the perspective of the deep sea that we just don't answer where is the energy for life coming from? How do these animals do that? That's a super important question. For that, you'll have to count and know and weigh the biomass and find out what strategies all the different life forms have. We have meanwhile worked on a lot of archive sediments. We've asked everyone and myself, I kept my PhD sediments. That's my biggest advice to all of the young students here in the room. Um, never throw away your samples. You don't know what 20 years later you might have as terms of questions for them. Okay, your peers will not be happy that you need refrigerators and shelf space and all of that, but I kept all my samples and I just used them to compare with new methods what is happening. And for example, we could show and publish very recently that there is already a change. So while the CS was retreating, there was more primary productivity and more algal pigments are already deposited in the sediments. But we were just in that time, we are now in that time where the Arctic Ocean is beginning to change. We cannot see it yet, only in these traces of algae, not yet in the animal life. So the big questions that I have for the two people coming with me is, can you please help working on this big archive that we have formed, the first database of Arctic life, where we are just beginning to see a change in the animal biomass and abundance. So again, you see all of those dots. These dots is total biomass of life, but now a brand new data set from a former PhD and postdoc of our collaborative group. And she tried to find data that bring her back to data points that were from the 90s and 2000s to put a few extra dots. And she can see, yes, the dots are getting bigger around the shelf area. But we don't have this investigation yet for the deep sea. We know nothing about changes in the deep sea. And so now is the time to go back and answer the question if there's already more life down there. That is a great project. Note that for all of the questions of deep sea life in the Arctic, we have just a handful of points. These are all the data points that exist on Earth. They're well sorted. Our colleague Andrei Vedenin, a young Russian scientist that had fled in time after the war and was accepted by Senckenberg to work in Wilhelmshaven. He is there with all of his expertise and he has put together all the data that are available for more younger generations to put more data and answer the question, how is the change happening? Here 
at the surface of the ocean, we have, of course, three, four, three uh, orders of magnitude higher abundances than down in the deep sea, but every life matters is what we think. So I come to the end slowly by telling you that this whole perspective of how surface and, and seafloor are connected, putting carbon, putting biogeochemical data, rate data, function data, of course we want to put the life in it and really understand who are those critters that are demanding to eat 10 slices of toast every year when there is only one for their availability. So we need to look for additional carbon flux. That's the other big part of the mission that I'm undertaking. We bring much more cameras and technologies to look for extra life that we have not accounted for. We have one idea, and that has to do with jellyfish. So this is a, a little clip of a robot. And again, when you look carefully, you see that it's very turbid, the water now. You can see a bit of smear and see how much there is. This was shown by a robot who can move away really far from the ship. And there it recorded surprising amounts of blooms of jellyfish. We saw normal jellies, we saw all kinds of different jellies, we saw ketognats, we saw so much different forms of life in a quantity that we have never sampled. Is that new? Has it always been there? And we were just not able to capture it because you can't capture them with a net, you can't go with the ship, as I said before. That's one idea that we have. But there's more. One other mission that I undertook brought me into an entirely different ecosystem. And I would, for a small moment in time, just show you again the small autonomous robot Nui that Woods Hole has built. It can free itself of cables, and it can go on a long mission under the ice far away from the ship to undisturbed waters. What we wanted to do is, at that time, go out to the deep sea, but not study the abyssal plains, but study the sea mounts that are fully unexplored. We actually took the first mission with a robot to an Arctic sea mount, a giant sea mount that roots in about 4.5 kilometers depth and goes up to about 500 meters, a giant sea mount. So that robot met a lot of interesting forms of life on its dive. Um, I will jump for a moment to where it's going through the jellyfish, and then the first images appears from a seafloor that no one has seen before. It took us really a moment to understand what we were seeing. And that's for you, daughter. We saw, daughter is the most famous Arctic sponge taxonomist, and we saw a sea mount that was covered in sponges that were just crawling across each other and above each other. I've never seen such a quantity of life in my life, and that in an ocean that is the most oligotrophic food poor ocean ever. There were giant fat starfish like this one. I mean, this thing is that big and fat in an ocean where I just said there is only a little bit of slice of toast. We saw soft corals sitting on that sea mount. There was so much surprise in just one sea mount. It's the only sea mount of the entire Arctic Ocean that is mapped today. And you see a lot of the shimmering white. These are all kinds of polychaetes that live inside of the sponge that use it as a home, crustaceans, and so much life. This one sea mount has more life than the entire Arctic Ocean. And of those sea mounts, there are hundreds, if not thousands, in the Arctic Ocean. None of them has been properly mapped or has been investigated with a camera. So to me, linking up these different environments in the Arctic and solving the questions of where is all that energy coming from if we don't even have enough to feed the normal deep sea benthos is one of the biggest questions of our time because we have to answer it in the face of change. We don't know what will happen to the sea ice. We don't know what will happen to this life that sits on sea mounts that potentially eventually will become mined for metals and minerals and all of that needs to be solved now. These sponges are quite something. If you open them, in fact, I, I'm running out of time, I know, but I have to tell you an anecdote. When we first got a sample, it was a box cora, and these very hairy sponges were lying on a box cora, and I was doing my business as a chief scientist, and there, were, there was a big screaming and yelling on deck, and then I was uh, called as a chief scientist, and they said, we have hit with the box cora, we have sampled a polar bear. And I was like, what? <laughs> So I ran onto deck, there was a shaking student that looked in it and pointed and said, there is, there is the, the fur of a polar bear. And I looked inside, it really looked like fur of a polar bear. I was like, it's not possible. And I poked inside and it was a sponge sample. They look so hairy when you bring them up. 
And um, while the poor student, uh, finally, when we opened the sponge together, he was a bit um, uh, uh, confirmed uh, that, yes, that doesn't look like polar bear, but it is even more interesting. So it looks now, it, the picture is ugly, I know. It looks like you've decapitated some person or so. But this is the sponge tissue. And um, Geodia, we are among biologists, no? <laughs> so Geodia is a sponge that is amazing because it uh, has a soft tissue inside. And this is more bacteria than sponge. And the amounts of bacteria are tremendous when you put it under a microscope. And these bacteria are selected by the sponge to help the sponge digest whatever it wants to eat. The sponges sit on an old, ancient uh, leftover of a, of a seep. They sit on, on some tube worms that normally are associated with methane seeps. So they are apparently eating uh, dead life in a way, chitin-rich food. We uh, confirmed that with traces. These sponges get that big and a few hundred years old. We also confirmed that. So a mystery to solve. There's more. We discovered, meanwhile, hydrothermal ones. We've discovered entirely new ecosystems that live from hydrogen. So I could go on forever, but my time is up. And so I would like to end now with this idea that it's strange for science to operate in a time where we are still explorers. I mean, everyone that does deep sea work or under ice work, you are working towards a database of what lives on Earth that we don't have in our times. You do that everywhere in the deep sea. Every single box core, and Angelica has shown that, has some species we don't know. We don't even have a number for, if given a name. But names matter to, for the life and the changes that we are about to witness. Every name that we give matters because it puts those organisms on a map. If we don't name them, we don't have them, we, don't, we, can't, we can't even know of them. And so I find the work of biologists in these times, and especially also taxonomists that give names, critically important for society. It almost has a, it has a cultural value to do that, to put organisms on a map. And for the Arctic Ocean, where we haven't mapped the seamounts, where we're just beginning to understand hydrothermalism and volcanism under the ice and all of that, it's, we are in a time of explorers, but at the same time, everything is changing. This is again the map of the sea ice. We know the trend. 13% per decade. It means with the new predictions that just came out from the World uh, Climate Council that beyond 2030 there is no further safety that we will not be the first ones to, to experience a summerly ice-free Arctic Ocean. It is the most likely assumption to take that between 2030 and 2050 there will be no more ice on the Arctic Ocean. And the very inquieting news is that since about eight years, the Antarctic, which was stable, has also started behaving like predicted, warming too fast with a warm ocean and a warm atmosphere. We have eight years in a row of sea ice minima in Antarctica. Again, no one would dare to say this is a trend. It could be like 10, eight weird years. But we know from the Arctic that Eight is a relatively stable number, and the more likely assumption is in Antarctica, we will see at a similar speed the loss of sea ice. With that, the loss of the most amazing organisms I haven't even talked about, marine mammals, seals, penguins, they depend on sea ice. I've just talked about some sea cucumbers and worms and crustaceans because they are what the deep sea life is made of, but the same is true for those uh, organisms that many people cherish. So what can we do? We can just uh, do our job really well and try to find out how sea ice and ocean and seafloor and us are linked. And we can try to communicate and show the threats that we have. And we can still try to be the best explorer of all times. And this is an explorer place. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs>